أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيدنا ونبينا أبي القاسم المصطفى محمد وعلى آله الطيبين الطاهرين السلام عليكم brothers and sisters uh, inshallah you're doing well Welcome to another one of our Mizan live sessions. Uh, as you know, uh, in the month of Ramadan, we have been discussing the tafsir of uh, Surah Yasin. Uh, Alhamdulillah, today is going to be our uh, second session. Uh, in the last session, uh, we had the chance to uh, review the verses or go through the tafsir of the verses from verse uh, number one to number six, uh, roughly. There was a number of other points that we discussed at the beginning of uh, the first session that we had on Monday. And uh, those were very important points. So um, I won't be able to go through all of those points again. I won't be able going to go through 90% uh, of them, but I'll do just a very quick review on what we had discussed, a quick minute, a quick five minute uh, recap of what we discussed uh, to lay the foundation to uh, get started for today, uh, inshallah. So, um, today, I think if time allows us, we'll go from verse 6 to, I'm aiming for 20, 6 to 20, but I, I know that sounds uh, pretty unrealistic already. I know you guys are already probably uh, not believing me, <laughs> so we'll try our best. Um, but yeah, let me do a quick review of what we discussed previous session, and then uh, we'll have to get right into uh, today's uh, discussion. So. Like I did last time, I'm just going to post the link to uh, the text and also the um, recitation of Surah Yasin in the comment section in case anyone uh, is, you know, interested. It's It would be really cool if you could follow along with the Arabic text with the English uh, translation as well. So we said Surah Yasin, it's a Makki Surah. Why does that matter? Because a Makki Surah is a Surah that was obviously revealed in Mecca. And because of that, you will find that a lot of times Mecca surahs will be talking about more fundamental topics than they will be talking about the details of the religion of Islam. This can even help sometimes when scholars are having a discussion about whether a certain verse is speaking of a new teaching or it's just talking about general concepts. They will look at to look basically to see whether this verse was revealed in Mecca or it was revealed in Medina or the surah was revealed in Mecca or in Medina basically so it plays this idea of a surah being from Mecca or from Medina can have very uh, important implications uh, in the science of, of tafsir we said the surah Yasin has four main parts the first part it has to do with the prophethood of the prophet number two is a story of the three prophets that are dealing with a group of people Hopefully, if we get time, we're going to discuss part of that story today, inshallah, uh, to discuss who were these three prophets, uh, what time was it that they were uh, spreading their message, what city was it that they were going to, and uh, how their conversation with the people of their time, what was it looking like. So that's part number two. Part number three has to do with Tawheed and the signs of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And part number four has to do with the day of judgment and also the return of the human beings, which is called in Islamic theology, it's called ma'ad, which refers to a'ud, which means to return. Um, these are the four parts that Surah Yasin mainly is going to cover. We said Surah Yasin is called the heart of the Quran in a number of ahadith from the Prophet. Uh, Surah Yasin is called the heart of the Quran and we had a little bit of a discussion as to why is that some said it was because Surah Yasin covers the most fundamental concepts in our religion it calls the Usul al din uh, sorry it uh, speaks of Usul al din which as you can see prophethood Tawheed and the day of judgment are the three Usul al din that we have because it covers all three therefore it is called the heart of the Quran other scholars said no, it has to do with specific verses in Surah Yasin, specifically the last two verses of Surah Yasin. فَسُبْحَانَ الَّذِي بِيَدِهِ مَلَكُوتُ كُلِّ شَيْءٍ 
flawless is the one who in his hand is the malakut. We said the malakut is the higher level of existence of everything that exists in this world. Everything that exists in this world, it has a material existence. It's called mulk. And then it has a higher level of existence. It's called malakut. He who controls the malakut of everything. Some said that's why this verse is called the heart of the Quran. Okay. We delved into the surah from the beginning. Yasin. We said Yasin is in some way or another. It's referring to the prophet. Now either it's a name of the prophet. Or it is a some sort of uh, word that God is using to address the prophet. Either one of those is possible. Wal Quran al Hakim. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala swears by the wise Quran. And we said that when he is swearing, the proof for what he wants to explain later on is in this swearing itself, which is the fact that the Quran is a miracle. It contains wisdom. Does it make sense for a person living in Arabia 1400 years ago to be able to bring about a book like this? Inna kalamin al mursan. You are certainly one of the ones who's been sent. Ala sirat al mustaqim. You are on a straight path. Tanzil al aziz al rahim. This Quran is tanzil. We said tanzil is means to send something down, but also in a gradual manner. We know that the verses of the Quran they were revealed twice. Once they were revealed all at once, right? In nanzalahu fi laylatin mubaraka, as we read in Surah al Dukhan which refers to the night of Qadr, which we are uh, getting closer to, inshallah. And the other is throughout the life of the prophets, right? And we said this tanzil, this idea of sending down the Quran, doesn't mean that it was a book up there with God and then he sent this book down here. No, it means that the Quran has different levels of existence. That's why in the verses of the Quran, the Quran is referred to sometimes at a, as a very high and lofty thing, and sometimes it's referred to as a book, right? And so these two don't necessarily match with one another unless you, the way you understand these verses is that the Quran has multiple levels of existence, right? If you want to understand what this is like, um, I'm just mention this and move on very quickly. Uh, there are a lot of things in this world who are in, uh, that, that basically have different levels, right? Dif different layers of existence, right? And one good example of this is light. Although this example that I'm giving is not probably the best example from the physics perspective, but from a from the perspective of normal human beings, when we look at light, you can see there are different layers of light, right? There's pure light that your eyes probably can't even take. And then there's, you put one filter there, it's a little less, a little less, a little less, right? There are different layers and levels to that same light. So the Quran would be something uh, like this, basically. Verse number six said, We have sent you so that you will do in the to a group of people whose fathers <coughs> were uh, uh, were not given in the. And we had a little bit of a discussion here, and this is where one of the brothers has actually asked me a question to cover. Um, before we move on, the question, uh, what we mentioned was that there are periods of time throughout history between the time of great prophets where um, s prophethood was not there as such in the sense that the message of the prophets was out there, but it was much more hidden compared to the time, for example, when the prophet himself was alive. Right. And we can see this very well with Christianity, for example. Right. When Christianity initially during the time of Isa, salam, Christianity was one way over time, the message got hidden, although the overall, uh, you know, the message might have been there out there for a long time, but it got hidden and hidden over time. Right. These were the periods of time that the Quran called periods of Fatra. So these periods of Fatra. A uh, question that the brother has asked us is this, is was there a living prophet somewhere in the world prior to our prophet declaring himself or was there a prophet who died near or at the time of our prophet's birth? This is a very good question. So the answer to this, because there are different opinions on this from, from the perspective of our scholars, as far as I have been able to understand, what these scholars will say is this, that we know one thing for a fact and that there is always some sort of representative of God on earth, right? When you open the book of Al-Kafi, which is one of our four main uh, books, right? Four main books of, of Hadith. 
Um, if I'm not mistaken, the first or second part is Kitab al Hujja, the chapter of Hujja. That whole chapter has to discuss this topic that there's always a Hujja, there's always a representative of God on earth. Now, is that representative always a prophet? No. It may, in fact, most times it won't be a prophet, maybe. So, what we do know for sure is that at every second, at every moment, there must have been some sort of a representative of God on earth. Now, was that person a prophet? We don't know for sure. So, before our prophet came into the picture, um, was there another prophet living? Maybe, maybe not. It's possible. Or it could have just been a pure individual who was a representative of God. And he was just spreading the message of Isa salam, right? Now, that message of Isa salam might have been hidden, right? That is completely understandable. And when you look into history, and like I said, a very proof for it is the people that we see around us every single day, is that you will see that there were many people who didn't know about uh, the truth of things. And that's why we have verses of the, in the Quran that those who don't know about the truth, the, the truth has not been delivered to them, that they uh, basically are not held accountable for uh, their disbelief. Because it's not really disbelief. It's the fact that they have not been presented with the truth before. Second question he also asked was, he said in the great in the book of Greater, greater Sins, right, the famous book of Greater Sins, it says that the Shia will eventually make their way to heaven based on good deeds, but it might take a while. Yes, this is something that we believe in, that, the, that anyone was the right belief system but had shortcomings in terms of his or her actions, that this person eventually will make his way into heaven, but he needs to be purified first. And that purification can come through punishment that comes either during the time of his death, or it might come during his, the time in his barzakh, or it might come during the time that he is, uh, you know, after qiyamah basically, or even during the stations of qiyamah. Some people go through a lot of difficulty in the stations of Qiyamat, and that is their purification until they reach a point where they will enter uh, into heaven. So there's a very interesting hadith about this whole topic. Unfortunately, we don't have time. I can't go into that right now. So, but that is something we believe in. Now, moving on, there is another uh, phrase similar to Yasin that a lot of people mistaken with the word Yasin. It's called, it's in um, I can't remember exactly which surah it's in, but it basically says Salamun ala il Yasin. Now, a lot of people think that this is the same Yasin, or a lot of people will read when they're reading in the verses of the Quran, Salamun ala al Yasin. Right? But that's not what the verse says. The verse says Salamun ala il Yasin, which is basically another name for Prophet Ilyas. Okay, so it has nothing to do with this Yasin. And this Ali Yasin, Yasin being the Prophet, Ali Yasin being his family, has nothing to do uh, with that, basically. All right. Okay, let's move on to the beginning of verse 7. Verse 6 said, you have been sent to give indar. Verse 7 moves on to what happens when you give indar. Quick point is that verse 6 said you were supposed to give indar. We asked a question at the end of last session. We said, how come the verse doesn't say you're supposed to give good news? How come the Quran is always about bad news? Huh? <laughs> Sometimes it seems like that, doesn't it? So why doesn't the Quran say we sent you le tubashira? Why doesn't it say we sent you le tundira? Right? And this is a discussion in, in Islamic akhlaq. And it basically goes back to human tendencies that at the end of the day, the human being is going to listen a whole lot more if you talk about warnings than you talk about Tabshir. He's going to listen a whole lot more if you talk about him losing something rather than him gaining something extra. And that's why in the verses of the Quran, the Prophet, not just our Prophet, any Prophet, you will see that the Prophets are referred to as Munzir, people who give warning. Sometimes they are referred to as people who give warning and good news. But you will never find them being referred to people as as people who give uh, only good news. So what do I mean by that? You will never find a prophet being referred to as Ya Rasulullah, you are Mubashir. And the verses continue. It never happens. You will only find the Quran will say either Mundir or Mundir and Mubashir. You will never find him just say Mubashir and move on. And that has to do with the idea that 
that's who we are we we listen to warnings more right and there's uh, more to be said about that but let's move on i want to stick to the verses inshallah so verse 7 laqad haqqa alqawlu ala akhtharihim fahum la yu'minu you come and you give them this bad news or this warning but let me tell you something ya rasulullah laqad haqqa alqawlu ala akhtharihim our command our decree has been established for most of these people what does that mean? Which command and decree is this? When you look in the verses of the Quran, you find that there was a qawl, a speech, which refers to a command, a decree of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that he made at the beginning of time when he was talking to Prophet Adam and Shaitan and that whole uh, story. He said, I will put you guys in hellfire and whoever follows you shaitan I will also put him into hellfire so the verses of the Quran are saying that this decree of ours has been established for the most of these people therefore these guys they will not believe anymore whatever you do they're not going to listen to you anymore and this is a scary point to reach where God will give a person times, chances over and over and over again, waiting for them to come back to the right path. If the person doesn't do it, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does something that he has not explained in these verses, explains it in other verses, where this person will not believe anymore. Now, what, what is that thing? He says in other verses, He puts Basically, taba'a is means when you stamp something, right? When you stamp something, nothing else can go in or come out, right? He says we stamp their hearts, their eyes, and their ears. And they are ghafil at this point. They don't understand anymore. So it's possible for someone actually to reach a point where he turns away from the message of God so many times that at one point, even when he does see the truth, still from his perspective, he's not seeing the truth. It's possible because this person has reached a point now where God has stamped his heart. Now, it takes a long time to get to this point, but it's possible, right? That's why in the other verses of the Quran, this is Surah Al-Zumar, verse 19. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells the Prophet, أَفَمَنْ حَقَّ عَلَيْهِ كَلِمَةُ الْعَذَابِ أَفَأَنْتَ تُنْغِذُ مَنْ فِي النَّارِ You want to save people who my decree of them being punished has become established and it's done, you won't be able to save them. In other words, these people are people who will not believe anymore because they won't believe anymore. doesn't matter what you do for them. They're not going to come back to the right path, right? When a person reaches this point, what happens usually is that this whole idea of a heart being stamped, a heart being done with, is usually accompanied with bala. It's usually accompanied with a catastrophe that comes and takes over the existence of this person. It just, this person perishes, as we say, right? That's why we have so many stories in the Quran of people who perish. They perished when? When they reached this point. That's why Ali ibn Abi Talib, salawatullahi alayhi, he has a very beautiful hadith. And this is hadith is beautiful and scary at the same time, he says, think about this hadith for a second. He says, You guys learn from the people who came before you. He's commanding us. Learn from the people who came before you. Before you become a lesson for the people who are to come after you. Right? Because if you don't learn from the people who came before you, in the sense that you disobey God, then God will send down a punishment. You will become what? You yourself will become a lesson for someone else. If you think about it in life, people are of two categories. Either they learned their lesson or they became a lesson for someone else. It's a very scary uh, hadith, actually. So that's verse number uh, seven. Before I move on to uh, number eight,
All right, I think we're back if I'm not mistaken. Let me know if, uh, if you guys can see me in the comment section. I think it froze for a second. All right, so yeah, I think we're back. All right, so let me take a moment. Okay, perfect. Uh, Salam alaikum to everyone who's with us, by the way. So before I move on to verse number uh, eight, uh, let me take a look at Brother Vasi's question. He says, if possibly there was no prophet just before the birth of Rasulullah, could it be possible that the representative of Allah were from his family, the Bani Hashim, our prophet's father, grandfather, and so on? Yes, it very much could be possible that that was the case. I don't know if that was the case or not. But that very much could be possible. Okay, so moving on to verse uh, number uh, eight. He says this. He says, these people who disobey us, they reach a point where we stamp their hearts. Then this happens. We take and we put shackles on the necks of these people, right? These shackles go all the way up from their chest all the way up till their chin. Dhaqna or dhaqna in Arabic means the chin. Because of this, they are staring into the skies. Right? So what does this mean? This means that these people, we, because of their disobedience, we have taken shackles, we have put it around their necks, they're facing the sky. If I'm facing the sky right now, I can't see you guys. I can't see anything that's going on down here, right? It says this is what we do to them. In other words, they are not able to see where they are headed. This is what the Quran is saying. And brothers and sisters, it's not so much of a metaphor, and I'll explain what I mean by this. It's not a metaphor. This is the natural effect of what happens when someone disobeys Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They don't see where they're headed anymore in the sense that they might make a bunch of decisions thinking that they're making the right decisions, but they're lost in their path. When you're walking, if you're looking upwards, you can't see the pit pitfalls, you can't see the potholes, right? So you walk, you fall, you stumble. This is what the verse of the Quran is saying. And then he continues, verse number nine. And we have put in front of them a barrier, a hijab, right? An obstacle. And behind them also a barrier. We have covered them. They try to look, but they don't have basar. Basar does not mean vision, it means insight. When you're able to look at something and you're able to see it fully, you're able to see it thoroughly, right? That's what basar or basira means. Since these people reach a point where we cover them from every side, they don't even know what they're doing. They can't see things properly anymore, right? In other verses of the Quran, the Quran says, وَلَا تَكُونُوا كَالَّذِينَ نَسُوا اللَّهَ فَأَنْسَاهُمْ أَنفُسَهُمْ Don't be like those who forgot God, and then God makes them forget themselves. In the Tafasir, you read this verse, they say that what it means for someone to forget himself is that he will do things that will hurt himself, and he will not be aware of it. He has forgotten himself. So, in Islam, the more your spirituality goes down, the more you lose Basira. The more your spirituality goes up, the more you gain Basira. The more you're... you're um, able to see things in their entire picture you're able to see things thoroughly right now this basira just to give you a very basic example this will show itself in a number of ways sometimes brothers and sisters basira having that maturity means that you're able to know when to say something and when not to say something basira is not just when you're making major decisions in life no basira can be in the day-to-day -day interactions that you have some people they're of this type. They open their mouth. They say anything that comes to their mouth. They don't have what we call basira. The more spirituality goes up, the more a basira of an individual is supposed to go up. That's why in about Imam Khomeini, they used to mention some of his uh, relatives and friends. They used to say this man was such that if there was something he wanted to mention to us, but he felt like right now wasn't the right time to mention it, he was able to hold on to things for 30 years of time before he opened his mouth about it because he was waiting for the right time and the right place to say it. 
This is a, a very clear example of what? This is a clear example of basira. And a person who wants to gain that has to increase his spirituality more and more. The more that's done, the more basira comes into the picture. Okay. So uh, uh, another point that I want to mention uh, about this uh, verse is this. We mentioned that some people might read these verses and say, oh, this is a metaphor that the Quran is using. It's as if there are barriers between them and behind them, right? Whereas, uh, and again, there's a discussion. Is this talking about this world or is it talking about the next world? Are they like this in this world or like this in the next world when they show up, right? The answer is both. Because we believe that whatever happens in this world, whatever we do in this world, the day of judgment will be the exact manifestation of what happened in this world. So when these people show up on Yawmul Qiyamah, these barriers will become very obvious to them. That's why in other verses of the Quran, particularly in Surah Ibrahim, verse 42, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَلَا تَحْسَبَنَّ اللَّهَ غَافِلًا عَمَّا يَعْمَلُ الظَّالِمُونَ don't think that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is oblivious when it comes to the dhalimun. He is just delaying their punishment until a day comes where their eyes cannot move. And then he explains more. On that day, their heads are upwards. Sounds, sounds familiar, doesn't it? Yes, because in these verses he was saying, Their heads are upwards. Here it's talking about Qiyamah. Their heads are upwards. لا يرتد إليهم ترفهم Their eyes do not move. وأفئدتهم هوا And their stomachs are empty in the sense that they are afraid and they are scared. So the answer is this: these verses that are talking about this, it happens in this world and in the next world as well. Both of them uh, together. Interestingly, there's a discussion here on the Sha'an and Nuzul of this verse that there were those in the city of Mecca who on a number of times, on a number of occasions, including Abu Jahl and Walid ibn Mughayra, both of these guys were very famous kuffar, people who created serious problems. Walid ibn Mughayra is a person that Surah al uh speaks quite a bit about because he uh, tried to plan and plot uh, to destroy the message of the Prophet. Abu Jahl, of course, we all know him. That Sha'an and Uzun says that these guys, they would send people to come and kill the Prophet while the Prophet was praying. But when they used to come closer to him, they were only able to hear his voice, but they weren't able to see the Prophet praying, right? And therefore, you find, We put barriers in front of them and behind them, and they're not able to see anymore. So some of the Mufassirin have mentioned this as the Sha'an and Nuzul of this verse. All right, let me just check real quick. Uh, no questions so far. You, if you guys have questions, you just put it in there and inshallah I'll get to the, the questions whenever I see any. Moving on to verse 10. وَسَوَاءُنَ عَلَيْهِمْ أَأَنذَرْتَهُمْ أَمْ لَمْ تُنذِرْهُمْ لَا يُؤْمِنُونَ It's going to be the same whether you give them warning or you don't give them warning, Ya Rasulullah. It's all the same for these people. They don't, <laughs> it's not going to matter to them, right? Moving on. إِنَّمَا تُنذِرُ مَنِ اتَّبَعَ الذِّكْرِ You only do in dhar, you only do in dhar that is beneficial to who? Man to those who accept the Quran and follow the Quran, right? Wa Rahmana Bil and those who are afraid of Ar Rahman Bil when other people are not around. These people who follow the Quran and they are fearful of, of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala when other people are not around, Fabashirhu. These people give them good news to two things. Maghfiratin Give them the good news that their maghfirah is going to be there, forgiveness is going to be there, and great reward, honorable reward is going to be there. A couple points about this verse. Number one, it's beautiful how the Quran says, Rahman. Those who are fearful of Ar Rahman, right? Meaning that even a person who is fearful of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, at the same time he has hope 
to the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is God wording the verses of the Quran in such a way that brings about these points, right? وَخَشْيَ الرَّحْمَانَ بِالْغَيْبِ The person who is fearful of who? Of the scary God? No, the one who's fearful of Ar-Rahman بِالْغَيْبِ then he says this, فَبَشِّرْهُ بِمَغْفِرَةٍ Then tell him that our forgiveness is going to be there. What does this mean? Brothers and sisters, what we can understand from this is that a person, therefore, if someone is really fearful of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, they will never ever have any sins or anything like that. Then why is it that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying, no, there is going to be a maghfira? It seems that the verses of the Qur'an are saying if someone generally really is the type of person who's fearful of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, if there are times where certain things slip, he makes a mistake here and there, then we are there to forgive his sins, right? It seems as though uh, this is what uh, this verse is talking about. Ver moving on to verse number 12, where we have a lot of discussion. Inna nahnu nuhyil mawta. The Qur'an here is trying to say, listen, these people, they're not going to listen to you. But let me tell you something. We are watching them day and night. Inna nahnu nuhyi al We are the ones who give life to the dead. Wa naktubu ma qaddamu. And we write the things that they have sent forward. Wa atharahum. And their effects. So we understand what it means to send things forward. Like you do something. Good, you send it forward for your qiyamah. Okay, makes sense. But what is it when the Quran says, wa atharahum, and their effects? That's a question we have to answer. Wa atharahum, wa kulla shayin, and everything, pay attention, he didn't say every amal, every action. He says everything. Ahsaynahu fi imam mubin. We have taken account of everything in a clear imam. Let's discuss this because there's a number of points that we have to uh, understand here, right? Number one, he says, we write the things that they have sent forward. Okay, so what are these effects? There are times, brothers and sisters, a person, he does something in this world while he is still in this world. In the verses of the Quran, this is, quote unquote, sending it forward because he's sending it to his barzakh and qiyamat even though he's still in this world. Then there are times a person does something, he moves from this world into the next world, and then the hasanat follow from it, right? A person opens up a hospital, those good deeds that follow from that hospital that he opened up, this is what atharahum, right? The Quran is saying, we are not leaving behind anything. We are going to make sure that this book, and we'll talk about Imam and Mubin actually refers to a book in just a second, it is capturing everything that these guys are doing. The things that they sent forward, even the effects that they had after they left this world, right? And brothers and sisters, the effect that you have, I want to take a moment to talk about this a little bit. The effect that you and I have, brothers and sisters, don't underestimate this. Sometimes there are certain things that you might say, uh, might be a good thing actually, that you say to someone, a good, a kind deed that you show to someone right? That might have a very strong effect on this person, right? You may not know, right? But just the fact that you have the intention, right? for example, someone comes into the masjid, you smile, right? Which seems like a half a second type of action. But this smiling, you don't know, you might say, Shaykh, oh, well, I've smiled to thousands of people, hasn't affected their life in a very deep and meaningful way. Well, yes, I understand. I've smiled to thousands of people that it definitely has not had a deep and meaningful uh, effect in their life. But out of the thousand people, one of them might have that effect, right? And if you smile with the intention that I'm smiling, that hopefully it does have this very nice effect in this person's life, then it will have, you will receive that thawab. This is what وَآثَارَهُمْ Things like basically that person goes on later on in his life because of that small thing that you did. He does things in a different way. Well, you're, you're being rewarded for every little thing that that person is doing, right? This is وَآثَارَهُمْ Then he says وَكُلَّ شَيْءٍ أَحْسَيْنَاهُ فِي إِمَامٍ مُبِينٍ And then we are taking account of everything in a clear imam. Brothers and sisters, we know that there is a book, 
in the verses of the Quran, it's referred to al lawh right? Lawh al mahfud This Lawh al mahfud is a book that everything has been covered in. Everything. I'm not talking about the actions of the human beings. All of the muqaddarat, anything that will happen and has happened, is happening and will happen. All of this is in a book called Al-Lawh al-Mahfud. Okay? Now, this Lawh al-Mahfud, brothers and sisters, is one of the books that God speaks of in the verses of the Quran. Pay attention because this point was very interesting for myself as well when I was going through this, right? The books that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks of are three actually. There are three different books that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks of in the verses of the Quran. Number one, the first book is this book that we talked about. The Lawh Mahfud, the book that when you do dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Ya Allah, um, for my future for example, in the muqaddarat of that book, in the decrees, the decisions made in that book, some of them are erased, some of them are added, whatever the case may be. This is Allah al-Mahfud. This is the book that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is talking about now. That everything is recorded in it. Then you have another book in the verses of the Quran. Uh, he says, when people come for Yawmul Qiyamah, when they show up, Kullu ummatin tud'a ila kitabiha al -yawm. Every qawm, every group of people are called to their own book. What book is that? This is different from Lawha Mahfud. This is a book that has to do with each group of people, each ummah, basically. Okay, that's the second book. Then there is a third book. Which book one? Which book is this? This one is the easiest one. This is the book that each individual is going to reach, is going to have, right? وَكُلُّ إِنسَانٍ أَلْزَمْنَاهُ طَائِرَهُ فِي عُنُقِهِ Every person, we have put the his the basically uh, a something like uh, something they used to uh, hang from the necks of people that speaks to the person that this person is right or in the verses of the quran we have that the chat the book is given to their right hand or to their left hand this book is different from the other two this one is the book of the individual deeds of this person Right? And that's why in some verses of the Quran it says that these people, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives them their book, if it's a good book, if it's a book of good deeds, this person calls the people around him and he says, Come and take a look at what I done, what I have done. Right? If it's a bad deed, he says, I wish I had never lived. I wish I had never uh, gotten up after the first time that I died, right? The first time they blew in the trumpet, I wish I had died that first time. I hadn't have gotten up again to even see my book of deeds. So the Quran speaks of three different books. The first one is there to cover everything. Second one is there, uh, the one that has to do with the ummas. It talks about the actions that an ummah did as a group. Third one talks about the actions that an individual did on an individual basis. Again, in other verses of the Quran, you see these are connections that Mufassirin make with different parts of the Quran, brothers and sisters. In other verses of the Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Inna kunna nastansikhu ma kuntum ta'malun. We were copying the things that you guys were doing. What does that mean? Istinsakh. Even in Farsi, they use it. In Arabic, they definitely use it. In contemporary Arabic. Istinsaf means when you take something and you copy it. Right? That's how they used to write books back in the day. They used to, the person used to write everything that was in there. The idea is that this lawh mahfud, this book that covers everything in the world, the other two books are copies from that main book. That's why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, we are making copies of the things that they do. Because when these people show up on the day of judgment, we have to give them individual report cards. We also have to give them report cards as a group. Okay, where is this information going to come from? We are going to do istinsakh of this from the main book. Inna kunna nastansa. We were consistently copying the things that they were doing, right? So it's very interesting how if you look at the verses of the Quran, just a one surah, you'll get one understanding. You connect it with other surahs of the Quran, 
then the understanding is very uh, different, right? Okay, we're coming closer to the end of our time. I was aiming to get to verse 20. It seems as though we're only going to get to the end of verse 12, right? Shout out to Sheikh Amin. But anyways, um, so let me share a couple more things, right? Uh, one hadith actually that sort of explains that everything that we do is going to be written down. Everything that we do is accounted for is this hadith, right? Beautiful hadith. Uh, it's uh, narrated from the sixth imam from... He's explaining about something the Prophet did, sallallahu He says, "Inna Rasulullah nazala bi ardin qara'a." One day, the Prophet went to a land that had no green. Right? It was it, it was not green at all. There's no plants. Right? فَقَالَ لِأَصْحَابِهِ إِيَّتُ بِحَتَبٍ. He told him, "Go and bring some from some wood that we can make fire with." Right? Some firewood. فَقَالُوا يَا رَسُولَ اللَّهِ نَحْنُ بِأَرْضٍ قَرَعَ They said, يَا رَسُولَ اللَّهِ You see around us, there's no wood around here. It was like, there's no trees to like pick up branches and stuff like that so we can make the fire. We don't have that. قَالْ فَلْيَأْتِ كُلِّ إِنسَانٍ بِمَا قَدَرَ عَلَيْهِ He said, okay, every person just go out in this desert and just find anything that you can find. Right? Just do your best. So they went. فَجَاءُوا بِهِ حَتَّى رَمَوا بَيْنَ يَدَيْهِ بَعْدَهُ عَلَى بَعْد they came, each one of them brought a little bit, but because there were so many of them, each one of them, when they threw everything in front of them, then it started to pile up, right? The Prophet said this, فَقَالَ رَسُولُ اللَّهِ صَلَّى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَآلِهِ وَسَلَّمْ هَكَذَا تُجْمَعُ الذُّنُوبِ This is how sins are compiled. Meaning that you do one sin here, you do one sin there, at the end of the day you look at it, you pile it all up. There is so many sins sitting there. Right. He said, you all need to stay away from the sorry, muhaqqarat. You need to stay away from those sins that people consider haqir, that people consider small. Right. I remember I was having this discussion with this sister once. Right? It's a relative of ours, actually. Right. And I was talking about music. I was explaining that certain types of music are considered haram. In Islam, music that's used in, within the Shia school of thought, at least, uh, music that's used in haram gatherings, in clubs, parties, things of that nature, it's considered haram to listen to, right? So I was explaining this to her, right? And I said, okay, this is, so it's haram to listen to certain types of music. And she said, I know, uh, but is it haram like killing a person? I said, no, <laughs> it's not haram like killing a person, right? But it's still haram. Haram is a haram, right? It's it's a red line of God, yes. It's not gonna, yes, obviously. If they put a gun to your head and they say either listen to music or kill a person, you're going to listen to the music, right? But the idea is the Prophet is saying, stay awake, be fearful of muhaqqarat min al Those sins of yours that people consider small, I say, oh, it's not a big deal. He's saying, listen, these things pile up, right? And then they create problems. And then he says this, فَإِنَّ لِكُلِّ شَيْءٍ طَالِبًا there is someone who is demanding everything that you do. He's watching everything that you do. The person who's watching everything that you do, he writes the things that you send forward and the effects. And then he read this verse. And we have covered everything in this clear book. Now, the verse of the Qur'an referred to this book as Imam. And this is a question that we need to answer. Why didn't it just say, وَكُلَّ شَيْنْ أَحْسَيْنَهُ فِي كِتَابٍ مُبِينٍ As it has done in other verses of the Qur'an. Other verses of the Qur'an, the Qur'an refers to this as Kitabin Mubin, that famous verse that we recite in, in uh, Salatul Ghufayla, right? وَلَا رَتْبٍ وَلَا يَابِسٍ إِلَّا فِي كِتَابٍ مُبِينٍ Everything is written in, why is it that it's referred to as an Imam? Because, some Mufassirin say, because this book is the book that leads the other two books. We said that this main book, this Lawh Mahfud, that covers everything, the other books are copied from this book. Therefore, this one is like the leader. Thus, Imam in Mubi. Right? That's why uh, some have said this. Now, along these lines, I will, inshallah, this will be the last point that I'll make. Along these lines, we have hadith, brothers and sisters, pay attention because this point is a very important point. And for those who are in the Mizan uh, Science of Tafsir course, we have covered this in that course. So you should know how to deal with this before I even mention the answer to it, if you've been through our course already, right? 
Hadith says that this Imam is Ali ibn Abi Talib. We have to take a moment here because if you misunderstand this or understand it in the wrong way, then it's going to be a problem. Hadith says that this Imam in Mubin, that everything is Ahsaynah, we have taken account of everything in this Imam in Mubin. Hadith says it is Imam Ali. In fact, the Imam himself says this. Right? He says, Ana wallah al Imam al Mubin. I am by Allah, I am the one who is the Imam, the, the clear Imam, that everything has gathered, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has taken account of everything in it. Right? In another hadith, the Prophet he read this verse, right? Or this verse was revealed. Some of the ashab of the Prophet they got up, they said, Ya Rasulullah, is this the Torah you're talking about? He said, No. Is this the Injil you're talking about? He said, no. He said, is it the Quran that you are talking about? He said, no. Hadith says the Prophet, the Ali ibn Abi Talib was walking by. Prophet said, huwa hadha. This is who I'm talking about. Innahu al-imam alladhi ahsallahu tabaraka wa ta'ala fihi ilma kulla shay. He's the one that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has taken account of everything in. Meaning that he has the knowledge of everything. Okay. So how do we understand this, brothers and sisters? There's a very important point that we made about this verse. The verses of the Quran have different levels of meaning. When we have hadith like this that speak about Ali ibn Abi Talib or one of the other uh, you know, individuals like the Ahlul Bayt, for example, the Prophet himself sometimes, right? When they are given a part of the meaning of a verse like this, we call this the batna of the Qur'an. We call this the hidden meaning of the Qur'an. The meaning that no one can access unless that person is a prophet or he is an imam or a pure servant of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. These are not meanings that you can think about and come up with. Now, what does that mean? Because it is at a different level of meaning in the verses of the Qur'an, it does not negate the other levels of the meaning of the Qur'an, right? So when we want to explain this verse, we say, Ahsaynahu fi Imam Mubin, this Imam is referring to the book. It's referring to Lawh Mahfuz. Yes, at a deeper level, it could also be referring to who? It could also be referring to Ali ibn Abi Talib, or maybe even the Prophet himself at a deeper level, right? But the point is, this does not negate the apparent meaning, right? The meaning that comes to our mind when we read the verse initially, that this is referring to the lawhe mahfud. This is very important. Why? Because it's not only in this verse that this happens, brothers and sisters. So many verses of the Quran, we have hadith, that a particular term in the surah or in the verse is referring to a particular individual, for example. Right? إِهْدَنَا الصِّرَاطَ الْمُسْتَقِيمِ Who's Sirat al-Mustaqim? It's Ali ibn Abi Talib. عَمَّا يَتَسَاءَلُونَ عَنِ النَّبَاءِ الْعَذِيمِ Who's Nabai Adim? It's Ali ibn Abi Talib. Right? Uh, we sent a nadir uh, to every qawm. وَلِكُلِّ قَوْمٍ had. Who is had? Hadi. Ali ibn Abi Talib. So many ahadith we have about this. These are, in some cases, an example of that verse. In some cases, they are the hidden meaning of the verse. That's why. And I'll end with this, inshallah. And if you guys have questions about this, you can just inbox us, inshallah. Because I know this is this point that I'm mentioning is a little bit of a, a question, a topic that has many questions that come up with regards to it. Um, that's why when you look at Surah to Nur, famous verse of Surah to Nur, Allah Nur samawati wal ard. And continues. Basically, all of the verse, we have hadith that it refers to the Ahlul Bayt. So what? When when we come across this verse, we're not supposed to understand this verse anymore in the sense of Allahu Nuru Samawati Wal Ad, right? And then there's this light and there's this oil that this light is using. This is not what the verse is talking about. No, it's talking about that. At a deeper level, it might be referring to the Ahlul Bayt. Nurun ala nur. Hadith says it's an imam after another imam, right? <laughs> so this, is, this does not negate the idea of a light upon a light. It's a deeper meaning of that. The reason why I am mentioning this, brothers and sisters, is because there are times where people misunderstand this and they 
basically say, okay, from now on, ihdina salat al mustaqim means ihdina towards Imam Ali. No, that's not what it means. As salat al mustaqim has its own meaning at a deeper level. Yes, Imam Ali can be an example of as salat al mustaqim. Now, this topic has a little bit more discussion, or well, a lot more discussion, uh, <laughs> but um, I'll leave it at here. Uh, and inshallah, from next session, we'll continue from verse 13, which starts to discuss the story of the Prophets. The group of Prophets who went to the people, they didn't listen to them, we sent a third one of them. Where were these people? Who were these people? And what was the conversation that took place between them? We will discuss that inshallah in our next session. Thank you very much for everyone who was with us today. If you guys have questions, you can always inbox us at uh, Mizan Institute. Uh, and that, inshallah, will bring today's discussion uh, to an end. Thank you very much. Inshallah, keep us in your prayers during these days and nights, especially over the weekend, because most people will be attending the programs. We will be back with you uh, Monday afternoon, Monday 5 p.m., inshallah. Thank you. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.